Hey, internet friends. How are we supposed to examine the truth about anything that matters when the truth is buried so deeply beneath layers of rubble? Here in the United States, we're given glimpses of combat in lands many of us have never and will never travel. We're provided propaganda designed to inspire visceral and emotional responses. And we're fed carefully crafted narratives for the purposes of public endorsement. Endorsement of the well-oiled war machine, a machine that interferes, invades, occupies, tortures, and murders in an endless cycle of chaos and confusion. Propaganda is an essential part of this machine. Through the mouthpiece of the corporate media, overt lies and half-truths are cranked out to citizens through breaking news headlines, with information and imagery intended to traumatize and inflame, all for the purpose of rallying public support for wars the majority of us do not understand. It's emotional manipulation, and even though patterns have been established and agendas exposed, the corporate media is overwhelmingly successful in convincing citizens that these wars are fought predominantly in pursuit of peace. But can you say right now that you know the absolute truth about Syria, a country that's become the target of global interests? Well, I'm here to scrape away the blatant lies and deceit in an effort to uncover it. So let's begin by traveling back to 2010, the year the Arab Spring began, a movement the Western media told us was organic and spontaneous, but was anything but. The Arab Spring involved a series of demonstrations and protests across the Middle East and North Africa, the focus of which was economic reform and for democracy to replace the current political system. Requiring long-term rulers of countries like Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and Syria to either step down or be forcibly removed from their positions of power. That sounds great, right? Like the plot of some edgy Disney movie wherein the courageous and brave people of a country rose up against their ruthless dictators while the world cheered them on. And hopefully at the end, everyone was happy and had an opportunity to experience what true freedom really is. The ability to say yes, I do want fries with that at any number of fast food chains now located on every corner of their freshly liberated country. But in all seriousness, if you apply the lessons of the past to examine the present, the case of the Arab Spring very much seems like a postmodern coup d'etat rather than the feel-good story we were sold by the media. It's a tactic that has been effective in the Middle East for decades. The targeting of countries with geostrategic and economic importance by a network of organizations aligned with corporate interests. Like how the CIA and the British carried out a military coup in Iran in 1953, overthrowing the democratically elected government who attempted to renationalize Iran's oil, taking it away from the Anglo-Persian oil company, who later rebranded as British Petroleum, or what we now know as BP. Another example of the United States being involved in the Middle East way before official wars were publicly announced would be Operation Cyclone, the codename of the CIA's program to arm and finance jihadi warriors in Afghanistan between the years of 1979 and 1989, essentially fighting a proxy war with the Soviets who were also in Afghanistan. Because not only is Afghanistan of geostrategic importance, but they're also a country who sits upon a wealth of untapped deposits like gold, copper, iron, lithium, and above ground there's an abundance of opium in the form of vast poppy fields. Of course, the United States' involvement in these countries was well documented and quietly disclosed to the American public decades after the fact. You'll notice that this is a reoccurring theme throughout this video, a quiet disclosure of truth reported by government agencies or mainstream outlets only to never be addressed again because, one can only assume, the truth doesn't fit the narrative being pushed. Now that we've established a pattern, we can apply lessons of the past to analyze the present, starting with a few questions. Who benefited from the United States' involvement in Iran and in Afghanistan during that time? Did the American people benefit? Did the citizens of the foreign country benefit? Who benefited from the Arab Spring, the effects of which are still playing out before our eyes? It's been documented, but at the same time rarely reported across the corporate media, that the United States, through Republican and Democratic institutions created by Congress, in finance by the National Endowment for Democracy, among other organizations, trained individuals as agent provocateurs before and during the Arab Spring. 
which means that not all of the individuals who created or called attention to a problem during the Arab Spring were grassroots activists. Thus, the Arab Spring was not nearly as organic or spontaneous as the Western media reported. In what started out as social media campaigns, protests, and demonstrations turned violent quickly. Creating a problem, waiting for the reaction, and then offering a solution, a solution that was decided upon before the problem was ever created. This is known as the Hegelian dialectic, and the Arab Spring was phase one. The reaction to the Arab Spring, where we arrive at our second lie, is what the media has dubbed the Syrian Civil War. In its claim, the lives of between 350,000 to 500,000 people, according to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. There is indeed a war going on in Syria, but it is by no means a civil war. A civil war, by definition, is a war between citizens of the same country. To break down this conflict in an oversimplified manner for the purposes of this video, the Syrian war is a battle between the Syrian government and those who oppose the Syrian government. So how can a war be a civil war if there is a number of foreign backers on each side, among whom include Russia, Iran, Turkey, the United States, the UK, France, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. Critics of the Western media's coverage have long called the Syrian war an illegal proxy war. And a proxy war, by definition, is a war fought between groups, or smaller countries that each represent the interests of other larger powers. However, as recently as in the last month, the Russian foreign minister went as far as to say that, because there are special forces on the ground in Syria from the US, and the US no longer denies it, along with the UK and France and a number of other countries, it's not really so much of a proxy war as it is a direct involvement in the war itself. But the point here is this, that through the manipulation of language, the Western media has misrepresented what is actually happening in Syria, thus skewing the public view of why the United States is involved in the first place, and can't seem to leave. Which brings us to our next lie. We were told that the United States' involvement in the Middle East was in an effort for peace. I believe the lie went something like this. The Syrian people were oppressed by Assad's brutal regime. They started protesting, and in response, Assad killed peaceful protesters. Which, side note, we've established in this video that not all of those protesters were grassroots activists, but anyway, a civil war followed, resulting in Syrian refugees flooding into other countries. The United States stepped in to aid in the humanitarian effort, while also claiming to fight ISIS thus completing the mainstream media's narrative. If the United States' main goal in involving themselves in this conflict is to promote peace, then why are terrorists who are murdering Syrian civilians armed with US weapons? Who benefits from the United States being in Syria? Not the American people, not the Syrian people, who by the way, are a mix of sheiks, Muslims, Christians, and atheists, who managed to live together before all of this. But the media certainly won't tell you that, will they? And they certainly won't tell you this. If the Syrian government is overthrown, a new government that is friendlier to global corporate interests could be installed. A government who would sell their oil in the petrodollar instead of selling to Russia or China. And to really sweeten that deal, there's still this issue of the oil pipeline to Europe that goes through Syria. One of the proposed pipelines is Russian-backed, whereas the other is US-backed. Both of these pipelines go through Syria. Both the US and Russia happen to be waging a proxy war against each other in Syria at this very moment. What is the American national security interest that would be served by regime change in Syria? Well, uh, if, if you care about Israel, you're, you're, uh, you have to be interested at least in what's going on in Syria. Uh, we're fighting ISIS there. Uh, Iran is uh, seeking to dominate the whole uh, region. I Furthermore, it would be unfair of me not to mention the U.S.-Israel alliance because Zionism has played a major role in Middle Eastern instability. Israel currently illegally occupies the Syrian Golan Heights, and Israel has refused to give back this territory despite being told to, which has, understandably, heightened tensions with Israel's neighbors, whom presumably are aware of the greater Israel plan of expansion, otherwise known as the desired borders for Israel that would be used as a safe zone around the Zionist state 
and their illegal nukes. This plan could come to fruition if Syria is shattered into a thousand tiny fragments in a brutal civil war, leaving a lot of land up for grabs in the aftermath. Also of note, the reconstruction process for Syria would be mighty profitable for whoever lands those contracts. And war itself is a boom in business, especially to banks who provide loans and arms dealers who provide weapons to all sides of the conflict. The United States is the top arms exporter in the world, the majority of which are sold to our Middle Eastern allies. What do our allies do with those arms? Our own media has declared that they arm terrorists with them, creating this culture of endless war we find ourselves in the middle of. Because if there is no war, there is no profit. So tell me something before I move into debunking this final lie. Are modern wars fought to end? Or are they fought to continue if there's profit to be made? The final lie which we will tackle in this video is one that all of this context and history was building up to, serving as the main reason why the United States cannot leave Syria. The recent news that President Assad has once again been accused of gassing his own people. A gas attack targeting civilians, if true, is of course a war crime. However, in April of last year, a similar story came out when Assad was getting ready for an EU-UN peace conference. Without any investigation, the media decided to promote the narrative that Assad was directly responsible for the sarin gas attack. The Syrian president denied any involvement. Warmongers came out of the woodwork calling for military action. Days later, in response to the chemical attacks, the US launched direct military action at Assad in the form of a cruise missile attack on a Syrian airfield. Nearly a year later, in February of 2018, US Defense Secretary confirmed that there was no evidence of the Syrian government's use of sarin gas related to this attack, but maintained that he was still concerned about the Syrian government's use of chemical weapons. To just re-emphasize this point, the mere allegation of these attacks prompted the US military to intervene on the eve of peace talks. History repeated itself just a few weeks ago, in April of this year, right after President Trump announced that he would consider pulling troops out of Syria. Reports of a chemical attack with civilian fatalities in the rebel-held town of Douma surfaced. And again, the US government and corporate media immediately pointed fingers at Assad. Warmongers came out of the woodwork calling for military intervention. But what would Assad have to gain from using chemical weapons on civilians? Past investigations have cleared Assad of these allegations, yet still, here we are threatening to attack a sovereign nation on the basis of suspicion. When did that become okay? What if the roles were reversed? If there's a possibility that Assad was and is being framed for these attacks by the same forces in the region who use civilians as human shields on the daily, and know that a staged chemical attack would keep the United States and allied forces in Syria longer, then shouldn't that possibility be explored as well? What findings do you reckon that investigation would yield? To conclude here, the Arab Spring wasn't all that spontaneous or organic. It gave way to the Syrian war, which was then dubbed a civil war by the media. But in reality, it wasn't and isn't all that civil with multiple countries present in attacking each other by proxy. We were told that the United States became involved for humanitarian reasons, but there was no virtue to be found in the real agenda that only benefits global corporate interests. And then we were told that the United States cannot leave Syria because Assad keeps gassing his own people, even though past investigations have cleared him of this act, and he in no way benefits from gassing his own people. But the media refuses to ask those pertinent questions like, who benefits? Instead, airtime is filled up with images and videos of dead Syrian children. Because dead babies cause people to think with their emotions. To call for wars they know nothing about. Wars they do not realize will inevitably yield in more dead babies. What do you think, internet friends? Please question everything. Your TV, your radio, your computer screens, your alternative media, even me. I provide my sources. They're pinned as the top comment. You know I always look forward to your comments. Thank you for watching, subscribing, and supporting my channel on Patreon. Bye!